one of the things that you talk about in losing the Nobel Prize is the resistance to, to the, this idea that there was an origin to the universe, and specifically that a lot of that was based in an anti-religious sentiment, which is, this looks a lot like the very beginning of the Bible, and that scares a lot of scientists. Yeah. So and back then, in the, in the 1950s and so forth, when Fred Hoyle, who was an amazing astronomer, he won you know, basically this, the runner-up prize to the Nobel Prize, Crayford Prize, he ended up uh, saying that the reason that scientists are so adamant about the Big Bang is because they're obsessed with Genesis 1-1. <laughs> now, can you imagine, you know, Lawrence Krauss or something, you know, fame from like, oh, I'm obsessed. I have to prove that Genesis 1. <laughs> I mean, it's absurd. And, and, and as you pointed out earlier, most scientists are atheists. And the majority of the National Academy of Sciences, most prestigious organization on Earth, are declared atheist. Or, you know, 20% are agnostic or don't know, and 10% believe, say. And so, uh, so it's interesting that how much we've evolved just since the 1950s, and then to actually have that brought into focus, and that people now accept without a doubt that there was a uh, beginning of what we call the observable universe. That does not mean that we've witnessed time equals zero. And that's where things get really interesting, because we don't have a theory that describes how properties of matter, of space and time itself. I mean, have you ever thought, let's say time began. What causes something to begin when there's no something to begin with to begin with, right? So how did time change from nothing into something? And these are questions that have perfectly good answers, potentially, but we don't have the data. So my job is to collect that data or perhaps refute these models by collecting data that, that is objectionable under those hypotheses. So in this particular context, obviously, a lot of religious believers say, well, got a good answer for you, right? <laughs> what kicked off right. time? <laughs> but we have this whole religious literature that's built around the idea that there was a thing that kicked off time and that right. thing was God. This is what we call God in the in the, uh, the Thomistic model. But the scientists have, have been promoting uh, a bunch of different theories as to why the universe was created the way that it was, why, why it exists in the way that it does. And it seems like a lot of this is a response to some of the arguments, yes, that some religious believers have made about the fine tuning of the universe, the idea that a certain number of things had to go exactly right for us to be here at this time. And so you hear arguments made on a fairly routine basis about how, well, you know, that's just how randomness works. We're just the lucky ones. Mm -hmm. uh, and religious believers argue back, well, but why are we the lucky ones? And that, that's a pretty convenient argument, that we happen to be the lucky ones. Why wouldn't we have been one of the non-lucky ones, exactly? <laughs> uh, so the, how, do you, how do you circle, circle that square? I mean, mm -hmm. how do you... How do you come down on that particular debate. I mean, I think for me, it's so much fun to think about these things. So, so nowadays, you, you know, you're alluding to the anthropic principle, which, which I'll describe in a minute, and the multiverse. It's funny, in scientific circles with my scientist friends, I can't say multiverse without getting into a fight. You know, like you say multiverse, they're like, we're going to take sides. And some people say, that's not even science. Or they'll say, that's, you know, that's pure nonsense. Or they'll say, this is the best answer that scientists have. And, you know, the, the, the people out there, when they're not, you know, comparing me to like Chen Eager or whatever, they'll say, this guy believes that, that you know, that they, you know, the hypothesis, which scientists just use as a working tool and they'll reject it. I mean, they have much more faith in kind of the dispassionate scientist, which has led to this, to this real, you know, canard almost and, and, and overused stereotype that scientists are just these dispassionate people that work have no feelings, have no objective, have no motive, no biases. And, you know, in the book, I count many different uh, biases, prejudices that scientists, including me, are afflicted by. And I think it's important to realize that, that when you have these discussions, when they turn heated, and I think, you know, it's interesting, I never hear from the religious. I hear crazy things from religious people, you know, that are just non-scientific to bolster their own hypothesis. They're, they're perfectly willing to have confirmation bias sometimes too. But in the case of the scientists, I think they're, again, this is touching back on some deep thing within them, a sensitive nerve that, you know, if there was something true about religion, then I have all these obligations and I have enough to do, at, you know, at the faculty club already. So I don't, you know, <laughs> I, you know it's, as I said, it's the hardest three hour a week job in the world. But, but you know, but I think it's, it's very interesting to, to think about these questions of what generated this new pursuit in science. Was it a re reaction to re these religious explanations? So Robert Jastrow, who worked at Goddard Space Center, and the, he wrote a book called God and the Astronomers. Now, he was a declared agnostic, and he said, upon the discovery of this cosmic background radiation that I study through telescopes like BICEP and the Simons Observatory, that people came, scientists who were secular, climbed to the top of the mountain and found a band of theologians rejoicing up there. Uh, on the other hand, when the Big Bang was first proposed by, by a Belgian priest named Lemaitre, he imp uh, implicitly told the Pope, do not use this as evidence for the creation narrative of Genesis 1-1. And he was intellectually honest about that, that this is not necessarily, should not be used. Again, these are non overlapping magisteria in Stephen Jay Gould's language. These are not, these are two different things. I mean, uh, to think about 
you know, reading the Bible as a science book is as absurd as reading a brief history of time and thinking, oh, that's how I'm going to raise my children, or that's my obligations as a moral ethical being. Um, so I think, I think these 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 controversies to me are are so are so much fun because these are two puzzles, and we may never go to the we may go to our graves and not answer these questions, but to not think about them, I think it leaves a life of of a slight impoverishment that my colleagues, unfortunately, many of them, many of them too, love to think about and love to talk about it, though they stay in the closet about it. Thank you for tuning into The Daily Wire, one of the fastest growing conservative media outlets in the country. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to give it a like and subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss out on any of our content.